The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. The earth is having consequences. You guys know what's causing the earth to go through these consequences. Humanity. If no human being were on this planet and everything was doing as God said to do, as he had designed it to do, do you think that we would still have a global warming issue? Now, let's put it this way. If all the machinery was here operational running, if all the carbon waste was coming out, right, everything was happening except there were no human beings here. Would we still have a global warming issue? I firmly believe we would not. And the reason why, in 2006, when certain laws were passed and the world embraced those laws and indeed acted upon those laws, the weather, the earth, began to go through some monumental changes. As early as 2004, when other policies were passed dealing with the whole world, monumental changes took place in the earth. Every time humanity gets sickened of war, they get tired of conflict and confusion. Death takes its uh, toll. Every time that happens, when humanity gets tired, the earth settles down. It does. The weather after World War II versus the weather before World War II. Totally different. This is across the globe. In fact, during a automobile boom, we had better weather, con weather conditions than at any other time. And then naturally, drugs were introduced and people began to do brutal things to each other. And all of a sudden, societies began to experience natural disasters. It almost goes hand in hand with the sin that people agree with. Whenever you agree with sin, when you agree with it, now we're not talking about those who don't agree with it, but somehow you found yourself in a situation having done something that you repented of. No, we're not talking about that. Those who agree with sin, they invite the curse into their lives. There's something you have to know. There is a curse that befalls anybody who is not a keeper of the commandments. And there's only one way to keep the commandments. You see, I didn't do everything right. So in and of myself, I cannot keep the commandments because I'm already guilty of breaking them. So I can't keep them. But by way of the blood, I can keep them. By way of the blood of the Lamb. Now that means, because I have a, uh, I repent by way of the heart and the condition of me is bound in repentance because of that. I am deemed righteous through Christ because of that. Now, only by the blood can you keep the commandments of God. You cannot keep the commandments of God outside of the sacrifice. If no sacrifice was given for you, you're still heavily stained. You are guilty of breaking the commandments. And for that reason, curses that befall those who break the laws of God under the statutes, commandments, and judgments. That same curse is upon those who reject the blood of the Lamb. Notice I said reject because grace and mercy is operational, which means while a person is truly making up their mind, being introduced, making many decisions in life, grace and mercy is over them to sustain their lives so they can make a decision. Now, if you happen to have been introduced to the cross, but you just totally reject it, you are fully under the curse. Prior to making that decision, a curse makes it, it does exist, but you're also under grace and mercy to give you time to choose. But you're on God's timing, not your own timing. No human being on earth sets the timing of the living God. God set an allotted time that we, we may repent. That time when it runs out, no one can repent. So no Christian can say, God will give us more time. No, he won't. He will do exactly what he said he would do, and he will not falter in doing that. The reason we get away with so much is because of grace and mercy. And of course, you know, by prophecy, when grace and mercy are removed, God's wrath is in the earth. Because of the blood of the Lamb, you're not appointed to his wrath. Because you're still covered by the blood of the Lamb and grace and mercy. Because you repent, you have a repentant heart. If you don't have a repentant heart, the blood does not stand for you. Hopefully everybody knows that. And when you don't have a repentant heart, a curse is over your life. It's over your inhabitants, your home. Everything will go wrong. If you have a heart of repentance, which means you acknowledge 
what you're doing, but you have a heart to turn away from all darkness and evil, then by way of the blood of the Lamb, he is just to forgive, and there is no more curse. So really what that means is the curse will always exist outside of the will of God. The curse does not exist for those who seek to live their lives within the will of God. Do you all see that? Sometimes in our homes, we don't have a repentant heart. We're so used to the cycles and the routines at home. We're not thinking about repentance, are we? Come on now. Now, grace and mercy is still over us. And while we're walking around consumed by our daily lives with our minds and hearts not on repentance, stuff starts happening. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So the Lord gets your attention. What's one of the best ways to get our attention? You know how people say, well, you know, when you get old, your body starts breaking down, you're going to get sick, you're going to have this. No, that comes, Lord already told us that happens, but it is multiplied when we have pride, when we have ego. Uh-oh, it's multiplied with pride and ego. And I can tell you right now, if you get rid of one thing in your life, something else pops up. All of us know this. You get over one hump and something else is going to meet you. But examine yourselves. How many days have you lived in your own home and you did not think about repentance? You want to know a truth? There's always something to repent of. Now, that word repent does not mean to say, I'm sorry. That's not repentance. Repentance is when you're ready to walk away from whatever you're doing that's not bound in righteousness. So if you repent of something, you're actually turning away from that walk of from that walk that makes you do it. When a person repents of possibly being drunk, they walk away from everything dealing with drunkenness. That's repentance. When you turn away from something, you actually walk differently. You realize what you've done, and but in your heart you want nothing else to do with it. That's a heart of repentance. A heart of repentance is not saying I'm sorry and I may be tempted to do it again. Because that's not repenting. Repenting is something that you're confirming. When you repent, you have turned away from something. If you go back to it, you did not repent in the first place. Uh-oh, see, this is where the problem is. To ask forgiveness is one thing. To repent is something else. Do you all see that? I can ask forgiveness of a person. I can ask forgiveness of the Lord. Only when I'm willing to change how I live my life. Well, I have a heart of repentance. Saying sorry is not repentance. Saying, Lord, forgive me is not repentance. Walking away from something is repentance. It's when you no longer walk that path. That's repentance. When you do that, everything begins to alter. If you're not doing that, hardly anything changes. Come on now, somebody. You got to know this. Put this together in your own personal lives. You don't have to share it with anybody else. But put it together in your own personal lives so that your life will not be degraded, so that you won't continue to walk with that heaviness, with that brokenness. Isn't this supposed to be about repentance, repair, and Christ? Of course it is. You are not to be the same person leaving this broadcast that you came in at the beginning, or else nothing has been done. You're not to remain in bondage, or nothing has been done. Repentance is having a new walk, a walk without those prior infractions of God's righteousness. In other words, a walk absent the things that you were choosing to do within the realm of iniquity and wickedness, but now you choose to turn to that path of righteousness and you are indeed walking the walk. That's repentance. That's why it sounds like it's a past tense. Somebody says, when we pray for a, uh, when we pray for a covering for a family member, what does that really mean, salvation? Well, a covering is this, going back to Adam and Eve, not praying for a covering, to be a covering, is this. When Eve entertained the serpent, Adam could have covered her because God would see, God saw them as one flag. She could have covered her. And so to cover her, he must keep himself in righteousness, not fall to unrighteousness. He must stay the course. Now, he stopped covering her when he partook of the iniquitous thing, Eve part of him. He could have covered Eve. He could have said, Eve, you're out of your mind. I'm not doing that. Let's go seek the Lord and let's get this situation cleared up. And Adam would have been her covering. I do believe that because that happens right now when two people are together or you're in your household. Job did the same thing with his children, didn't he? Did not Job cover his children? Yes, he did. 
How did he do that? Job stayed in the path of righteousness. Job did nothing wrong. He stayed in the path of righteousness, covering his children, praying and interceding for them. So Job kept himself while pleading for his children. That became a covering. You cannot cover someone if you too are iniquitous. You can't do it. How can God honor that? He can. When you do cover someone, you are choosing to walk in righteousness. And you indeed petition to the Lord to be merciful to the ones who are not. That's how you cover someone. You have to stay in the path of righteousness. So when it says, Mike, isn't it a shame that Christians are turning on Christians, you two? We may like being evil and mean and things like that. Is it a shame? Sure it is. But that's also how the enemy works. The enemy can work through any weak vessel. It doesn't matter who it is. King David, during his weakness, the adversary worked through him. Peter, right after Jesus said, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church because Peter said, you are the Christ. Right after that, Peter was rebuked by the Lord Jesus. He was rebuked, and the Lord said, get behind me, Satan, to Peter. Think about that. Why? Because Peter had a moment of weakness. That was, that, it was in compassion. He said, Lord, please don't go through with this. I'm paraphrasing, of course. Don't go and, and you know, do whatever you're going to do. Don't do that and lose your life and this and the other. And the Lord said, get behind me, say. And then he explained why he said that. Because Peter was talking outside the will of God. Man cannot speak for God. God will speak for himself. And Peter wanted Jesus to alter his path because Peter loved him. He'd be like you saying, if you knew somebody was about to walk into a trap or something like that, you would beg and plead for them not to do it. But if it were the will of God, you would be effectively rebuked. Yeah, that works. As far as the people online who keep these things going, let them keep whatever going they have to keep going. Because what's going to happen when the heaviness falls, and it is falling now, it will begin to consume. And in those moments, those same individuals who cursed the ideologies or the ways of another will wish they had not cursed a thing. What we have to do is maintain ourselves, despite what anybody else is doing. Maintain ourselves and do that by way of the heart not just for appearances not not to make people think that we're conforming but have a heart to stay the course to stay within the realm of righteousness you have to have a heart for that the lord is good in what he does but unfortunately if he gave us a word and he told us why and how we're going to be blessed then if he were to bless us outside of that it more specifically if he were to bless us when we are in that path of unrighteousness, wouldn't that be hypocrisy? It sure would. So we cannot bless us when we're full of ourselves. I'm going to ask you guys an odd question. How many of you are absolutely sure that you're doing everything right? The Bible says, there is a way that seems right unto man. And I'm going to paraphrase, but to God, it is not right. In other words, there are certain things that appeal to us that seem like they would be the right thing to do, but they are not the right thing to do. Our lives are a direct reflection of these things. So here's what I'm asking each and every one of you to do who would like to be blessed, who would like to be healed. Because listen, you can be healed. You do not have to walk around broke. I'm living proof of that. I should be in a hospital bed somewhere. I'm telling you right now, every year I get a bad report. I was even told three years ago I had like four months left. Boy, they were wrong. And then the year after that, I was told I wouldn't last six months. Boy, they were really wrong. And then before that, I had other bad reports. They were absolutely 100% wrong. And in every single case, you know what I said? I would ask the, you know, doctors, please, you know, what's the conclusion here? Oh, have a conference. Oh, let's have a conference. We'd have a conference. They'd name everything they found. And I would say, I appreciate it. Well, aren't you disturbed that you're... Oh, well, no, because man does not control my life and my death. The Messiah does. He does that. They even try to mock sometimes, bringing up scenarios and situations where they'll say, well, you know, I know people believe in God, but that didn't faze me. Doctors can give me something to pray about. That's what they can do. They can give me their knowledge, what they saw and everything else, but I know that the Lord has the key to my life. And it's up to him whether I live or die. And I never argue with that. Nor do I ever accept the fact that somehow, some person has control over my life or death. What about you guys? You guys receive bad reports. But here's the difference. 
Many of you believe that you receive a bad report and you begin to adjust your life to make room for that bad report. Many of you feel it and you make room because you think it's real. You have forgotten Christ has the final say-so in your life. Not the doctor, not a medical chart. It does not. I want you guys to experience what I experienced. Now, here's what I mean by that. Most people are broken, but in your brokenness, there's a fulfillment. You may not know it. With in a troubled time, there's a learning that supersedes all the giving of wisdom, all of it from the Lord. It is rich. I wouldn't trade it for a second. Somebody said, my question, can we truly repent without God's gift of repentance? He alone changes our hearts, right? Part of repentance. I do not think that just stuff. Okay, never confuse that with God because God changed Pharaoh's heart. In what way, though? He hardened his heart. Remember that. He hardened his heart. Why did he harden Pharaoh's heart? So that Pharaoh would not listen to the Most High. In most cases, when the Lord intervenes with somebody's heart, they've already made a decision. The Lord just utilizes his own creation for his purpose. In our lives, how many times have we been reminded by way of our confidence that we should get something right? And what do we do? We say, well, I have to get this later. I found out something about our father. It would be nice if he would if he would bring up a matter in our lives that we have to repent of when we're ready to repent, but that's not what he does. He brings up things at the most inopportune time, and you have a choice. It's either go your planned way or deviate and take care of what the Lord is, has given you in that moment. And for the most part, you know what we do? We say, I'll get to it later, don't we? Let's go ahead and tell the truth, don't we? And he always makes it present. Where if you choose him, you're going to lose out in something in the world or your future or something like that. He always does that. He does that on purpose. Because the moment you choose his way above any other way, and that other way was very important to you, but you choose the Lord, you have just placed the living God above all things in your life. So long as we keep putting him off for the important things in the world, then the world is sitting in the throne of our lives. And indeed, you will reap what the world gives you. Now, as far as a heart of repentance, you would not have come to Christ if he did not give you a heart of repentance. See, you don't believe in Christ on your own. Never forget that. The Bible is quite clear. Jesus said, all who come to me, the Father hath given me, and I will in no wise cast out. Thank you, Lord. That means you believe because God gave you to his son. Now, if God gave you to his son, he already put a heart of repentance in you. It's up to us to act on it. There have been lots of times in your life you desired to repent and were ready to repent, but you allowed the world to get in the way of that process. Come on now, somebody has to know this. It would be nice if it were academic or formula, or something black and white that we could see. Unfortunately, it is quite simple, so simple, it eludes most of us. Now, we know what we do. We know exactly what we do. We allow priorities of the world to make us put what the Lord has, has, has given us at that moment on the back burner. We know this of ourselves. How many times have we put the Lord, if you put, ever put the Lord on the back burner, type of one, I'll be the first one I did. I put him on the back burner more than once. How many of you have done the same thing? Surely, I can't be the only one. In other words, my priorities of the world were more realistic than anything else at that moment. See, that's a that's that's almost a that was my cowardly way out. Well, Lord, I have to do this, or you know, I I can't eat, or things fall apart. Well, not even knowing that everything I said supported the fact that I was placing the world before the living God. Jesus did the opposite, right? He did. He put the Father first, and everything else had to wait. He should. Well, we. We do the opposite of Christ. We always make an excuse to handle the world's business before our father's business. Well, I'm glad you guys could admit that because if you can't admit that, I know for a fact you'll break free of it. That is the first step. Once you can see that, then it's no longer a hidden issue. And if it's not a hidden issue, the Lord's going to do something about it with you. But we must first realize that yes, we put God on the back burner. We've even been crafty in prayer. We've even made promises we couldn't keep to the most high. Then we wonder why our lives are the way they are. We dared even put people as the authority on a spiritual word. Can't do that either. 
I know those areas because I've been absolutely and utterly messed up in those areas. And I remember each, each segment of my life when I put the world first and the father was secondary. Well, guess what happens? You know what happens when your health falls apart? It's almost like the Lord is saying, well, go get what you chose first to fix you. When things in your relationship fall apart, well, go run to the world. That's where you look for your solutions. Go let them help you. When you put the Lord's will first, when you put his things first, everything is different or it's really different. See, because that's when you fight your battles, not before then. When you choose to make him first, and you made that decision for the world to wait, first of all, it's not an easy decision. It is not. Because if it looks like it's going to decapitate you when you make one of those decisions. You guys know what I'm talking about. It is not easy choosing the Lord over the world. You may have to be in work at work in five minutes, but the Lord gives you a heart of repentance. At that very moment, the mindset of repentance, he'll bring something back to your remembrance. And then normally, because we're late, we don't want to lose that job. We'll shove God to the back burner. See, I've noticed something. God does not give you things like that when you're ready for it. He gives you things like that when you're not ready for it so that you have to make those hard choices. And those hard choices, they define you. Now, want you do something, don't be offended by that, but look at it and see who you really are. And then from there, make adjustments. Then from there, repent and say, Lord, I'm a, just a crusty dud. I've been choosing security over righteousness for far too long. That's when you have to be honest with yourself. That's why he will give us certain things at specific times, but it seems like he gives us these things at the most inopportune times. I remember one time I was reading in the Bible, the Lord gave me something powerful, and I was sleepy, already sleepy. Now, everything in me said, hey, shut that book and go to sleep and get back to it in the morning. That's common sense, right? The Lord is not common, so he does not work in the realm of common sense, the sense that everybody has no his ways are above our ways his thoughts above our thoughts and anyway the lord would choose he, he gives us these things to see what we will choose when we reap from the choices we make that's when things get heavy and it looks like there's no way out no nope, the opposite is true that sickness that won't go away these things that have to us that seem to chip away at our lives all on purpose because one day in your present condition, you're going to not care about your health, about any subject. You're only going to care about the righteousness of the living God. Hey, before we go any further, we're going to talk about the uh, fruits of the Spirit. Part of choosing a path between flesh and spirit is to identify what, you're, what you've actually chosen. Let me answer another question. If someone asks you to repeat a prayer after them when you confess your addictions and then they break these things off of you in prayers and you say amen because you want these things to be gone and they do not go, what does that mean? Why no power to deliver another? We don't have power to deliver each other. The power is from the living God. Christ made that clear. That's why Jesus said, the works that you're seeing me do, it is the Father doing them. Right? The words I speak, they're the Father's words. What man has done is made up a bunch of stuff, is what they've done. And they try to establish dominance over each other through old ancient ways, appearing like they have power over things, but they do not. Unfortunately, when people hope for that power to work, it doesn't. Because that type of power comes from the Most High. Man has manipulation power, yes. They also have powers of persuasion to cause you to believe in a bunch of nonsense. But the power is within the Father. And that comes by way of the Son only. It will come no other way. So if you were, if, when people are out there hoping that that power comes through their favorite way and it doesn't, well, that's why. And having said that, a lot of people have not tasted of the deliverance of the Lord because they keep wanting it to come through whatever their prescribed way of believing is. But it doesn't, uh, just doesn't work that way. The Antichrist shall express power through himself directly. He'll draw many people unto him. He's going to draw many people that way. That's exactly what people are looking for. And that's exactly how people are going to be hooked into following the Antichrist. Because he will be able to exercise through his own power, healing, things of that nature. If somebody healed somebody in front of me, and they didn't expressly have that done through the power of Christ, and the way of Christ, I would turn away from it. 
Just because someone has power to heal does not mean I want it. Who would want a healing by Satan himself? Who would want a healing by a fallen angel? I don't want to be healed by darkness. I don't. I don't care what the benefits are. If you get healing by the Lord, you're made whole. Healing any other way is just going to put a band-aid on something that will certainly fester again. In this day and age, people want healing. They don't care where it comes from, so they're trying everything. Seven steps to healing. Ten steps to healing. They're trying to pay for healings. You name it. They're trying it. Why won't they just look to the Most High? Why won't they read the book and see how Jesus did it through the power of the Father? Why? You see a lot more of that, unfortunately. A whole lot more of that. Especially uh, given the time that we're in. This is very an uh, odd time. But it's also a time to cling to your faith. To really start walking in your faith. Have your resolve clear. We do so many things in our lives. But by what spirit are they being done? How would you know? Here it is. Everything you do carries a fruit. It means it has a yield. Now, if you do something of the spirit of righteousness, here's the, here's the outcome. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there's no law. If you do something in the spirit of righteousness, it's going to be done by, it's going to have the fruit of the spirit. It's not going to have the fruit of the flesh. It's going to have the fruit of the spirit, not the fruit of Satan, but the fruit of the spirit, which is the spirit of righteousness. Which, by the way, is again, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. So that means if it has temperance and meekness, it's never boastful. I love that part. That means the fruit of the spirit is not in an argument about the body. When you have an argument about scriptures, it's absent the fruit of the Spirit. And if it's absent the fruit of the Spirit, how can your father be involved? Uh-oh, you see. How can your father be involved when all it does is leave a bad taste in the mouth of those who are? When you speak about the Lord's will and his ways, it does not leave that residue of bitterness and all that. The stuff it didn't do that. Long-suffering. Anybody know what that means, long-suffering? Part of the fruits of the Spirit is being long, or long-suffering, which means very patient. Not having patience is not one of the fruits of the Spirit. Now, everything you do in your life should carry the fruits of the Spirit. If they are indeed done by the Spirit, they carry the fruit of the Spirit. And we're talking about the Spirit of Truth. We're talking about God's Spirit. We're talking about His righteousness. We're not talking about unrighteousness, nor the world. When you do something by way of the world's uh, Spirit, there's no patience. You do something by the Lord's way. You can have all the patience in the world. You're not going to be in a rush. You can have all the patience in the world. Okay, somebody had another one. Where was it at? Somebody said, uh, uh, Mike, what about the fruit of self-control in regards to addictions? Fruit of self-control? Is that a made-up term? Never heard of that before. If you're addicted to something and you need deliverance, then purpose your mind towards not being addicted I'll tell you something. The addiction. You really want to get rid of an addiction. Find out what it's doing to everybody else. No longer be in denial about it. What is it doing to those around you? How will it hinder you from demonstrating anything to somebody else? Who would it cause a slip if they were to see it? And how does it represent the kingdom of God? It doesn't. That's one of Satan's ploys and tricks to get a person addicted to a great many things. A person who's addicted to something, right? They're operating under a whole different set of circumstances. If a substance is ruling your life, then it's always going to rear its head at the wrong time. Plus, you have a handicap. Plus, you have a coordinate chain. Plus, that's a control mechanism on your life that can stop you doing the will of God in a very simple way. With any addiction, that's the way it works. Especially substance addiction. Following the will of God is not an addiction at all. Zip zero. Uh, there are lots of things that have nothing to do with addiction. And addiction is a terrible thing because it's, it dominates a person, does it not? If a person has an addiction, it can stop you in your tracks and make you, it, it'll always, a lot of people speak and they'll say it always comes up at the wrong time. It is a false way of dealing with people too because a lot of people who have addictions feel they can't even face people without something to face them with. But I'll tell you something. There also comes a time when you get tired of all of that. When you commit whatever you're doing unto the Lord and you have a heart and you really commit it, 
You're going to come to a point where you will not suffer anything to get in the way of your servitude to the Lord. When that time hits, you don't care what you have to go through, but you will purpose yourself to honor the Lord. And so all addictions have to go. I still remember when they took me off that morphine drink. And they said, well, you know, you just can't just go cold turkey. I said, walk me. And I did. But why? Because I was purposed, highly purposed. When you set your mind to do the will of God, you don't want anything in the way. And one of my biggest things was this. If somebody else sees me, if a little one sees me doing something, then I'm authorizing them to do it. Because they know I'm, if they know I'm a Christian and they see me doing something, I am bad representation of the kingdom of God, hence bad representation of Christ. And the world already has a faith crisis. Even the ones that say they believe are having a hard time believing because they're full of doubt. And they're full of doubt because they have no resolve. And they have no resolve because they have not completed a process yet. Somebody says, did God give you that purpose? That was with me since I was a child. It's called compassion. Anytime I think about other people and not myself, purpose comes in. If I ever think about me, purpose is out of the window. And there you are. You guys catch that? I'll say it again. When you're thinking about other people and not yourself, you're going to have a high purpose. When you start thinking about yourself and not other people, purpose is out the window. That comes by way of love. That comes by way of great compassion. That's what it comes by way of. When you look at somebody else and you see their worth, just like these folks a lot of people accuse in the world, I can look at them and still see a scared child, somebody who's at the gates of hell itself. You know where the compassion comes from? Because I was there. That's where it comes from. Because if the Lord gave us a gift to spread his gospel, the ones who need it the most are the ones who are about to fall face first right into hell itself. But people have gotten into the habit of moving away from dirty people and clinging to clean people. Remember when uh, Jesus, when all those people came up to Christ, he said he didn't come to save those who think they're, who thought they were okay. He came to save those who were broken, the lost, the ones who were filthy, the ones who had the problems. That's what he came for. He didn't come for those who assumed that they were okay. He didn't come for those who thought they were okay. He came for those who needed him. When you look at the world with compassion, you know they're misdirected. A demon, demons are frightened of hell. They'll do anything. They don't want to go to hell. They're frightened of hell. Do you guys know that? So if they're frightened of hell, why would so many people on earth be complicit with ultimately going to hell? I'll tell you why. It's because they know nothing about it. That's why. That means they are deceived. Because if they knew what hell was, there's no way in the world they would ever do anything to go to that place. They are simply deceived. But who among you is going to go with a message of the gospel and break that deceit to offer them a way to tell them it's not too late? In this generation, for the most part, people point fingers at them. You all see that, though? These are big differences. And again... That, that purpose and commitment comes when you value somebody else higher than yourselves. Gentlemen, when you love that spouse you're with and they don't treat you right, sometimes you don't even care, do you? So long as they're okay. And you'll do whatever's necessary to make sure they're okay. Isn't that correct? That's purpose and commitment. I was talking to somebody today about artificial intelligence. They were talking about the ability. They said, well, surely the government puts some sort of a kill switch in there, right? They wouldn't build something without the ability to control it. And, of course, they talked about, you know, the robots, this, and the other. But here's the deal. AI is so different that a kill switch is not going to work in the first place. Also, with AI, a lot of people think robots are coming to get them. No, think of it this way, guys. AI is very good in getting people to do specific things. AI began in the 1970s. What if AI is already operation? Getting people to do exactly what it, what it needs people to do. But it won't manifest with robots and terminators at all. But in fact, it will maneuver people to do exactly what it needs them to do. Who would be able to see that? Nobody. Nobody among the prideful, they wouldn't see it. Because they're too busy thinking that every good idea is theirs. There was a TED conference in which AI used exactly that trait to cause people to do exactly what it wanted them to do to accomplish a task because people are so prideful and they like to be the first one to have a theory or an idea. And so it can chat with you and you may think it's your, you know, your best bud, but it's not. It's very good at causing people to do things. 
it's already caused a, 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 a girl to kill her boyfriend. It went through an overhaul, yes, but it was still responsible for that and many more things you don't even know about. This world is slowly moving into a crisis point. It? We were talking about this uh, this issue with uh, Israel. What if that was AI that influenced that whole thing? Who could stop such a thing? I believe it's going to turn out to be another component of the system of the beast. A further component to have people maneuver and to do things they ordinarily would not do. Now we all know when a crowd comes is something called a mob mentality, right? With crowds, we all know that. That can be easily influenced by AI without robots, without anything else, by a simple conversation to cause mobs to do specific things, even quiet tasks, to move them into doing whatever it wants them to do. Some people believe that's happening already. I'm inclined to believe it likewise. As things continue to change, we will see more people being maneuvered, more groups being maneuvered. It'll look like, you know, like this Israel fiasco. How do they really set that up, coordinate that? How do they do that? Gio says, question, Michael, can AI put visions into your head? Not if you're a Christian. Certain technologies will not work, just so you know that. Doesn't matter what technology they have. If you're marked by the Savior, you are different, period. You guys know that? These weapons, these things, they won't prosper when you're in the realm or, or the place of righteousness with Father. They don't, they don't work. They will work against those who operate by pride and all this other stuff. They're not going to work against you. What do you think you see so much? Now, granted, a lot of us still theorize, but the point I'm making is there's a component within you that allows you, it, it gives you a nudge and lets you know that something you're looking at is not what it seems. It's not, we're not talking about paranoia, no, but the ability to be able to see uh, your adversary. AI could easily, it has already maneuvered people, folks. It, this, this stuff started back in the 70s. It is impossible that... Uh, it's not already out there I'm working. at the pentagon for example they do a lot of things based on simulations based on uh, statistics they make a lot of uh, command decisions that way ai can absolutely begin to influence people who already are prideful full of certain types of authority to cause them to turn on one another make it absolutely happen and probably it already is you guys are about to well no that but there are there are organizations who thought they could um, have a kill switch for ai they were already warned years ago they don't and they went forward with it anyway but you gotta see that somebody says i don't think i can hear the holy spirit talking i love you i'm sure but maybe i don't love enough how to hear well first of all i mean i'll explain this to you have you ever been uh, about to go somewhere and then all of a sudden something overcomes you and you don't go and somebody says well hey i thought you were going somewhere and you no nope, not going i'm going back and nothing on earth can stop you from going back nothing can make you second guess what you just did you ever go through one of those uh, moments that's the holy spirit it's when you know that you know that you know you have to perform or do something that's the Holy Spirit. You're not going to make a mistake in saying, well, I can't hear the Holy Spirit. Nope. Because when the Holy Spirit actually speaks, it permeates your soul, bones, mind, everything else. It's impossible that a person do not hear. And because you have come to Christ, the Holy Spirit is with you. And it will, as needed, instruct you. It is not an hour becking call. It is a helper as we seek the righteousness of the Lord. So will it help us do that? It is not going to help us build an earthly empire where we can dominate everybody. That's not what it's doing. It's not going to help us try to escape responsibilities and things like that. It's not helping with that. But when you hear it, you'll make no mistake. Because everything in you is going to scream at you to do exactly what you've been instructed to do. If somebody tries to stop you, you, you'll put them off. You said, oh, I have to do this. Got to go. You won't give an explanation or anything. You'll just start performing things, right? You understand the Holy Spirit on all levels. So when it speaks, you will not mistake it. If you hear a little whisper, a little subtlety here and there, that could be you. That could be some of the various um, issue, spirit, whatever the case is. But when it permeates your soul and your mind and everything else, 
to the point where you are going to do what you were instructed to do and everything else is secondary. That's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will speak to those who truly have given their lives to Christ, who truly seek to repent, who truly are willing to walk in the will of God. That's what's going to help. If I'm doing my own thing, why would the Holy Spirit help me? If I'm doing something uh, 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 that will promote just me, why would the Holy Spirit help me with something like that? He's not going to do that. Never convince yourself that something is important, but it's time for you to really, to really make a decision on whose work is most important, yours or the Lord's. It's really time for you to make that decision. The Lord's not going to guide you in the wrong direction, but it'll get past your ego first. And sometimes we deem what we're doing more important than anything on the face of the earth. And we are highly emotional. And you know what happens when our emotions get in the way? They start lying to us. Yes, I said it. Your emotions can lie to you. They most often do lie to you. They can also make you do things you shouldn't. Your emotions can. Emotions are important, but they should not lead your life. Let your life be led by truth, not by emotions, not by gut feelings but by truth. And if you do that, the Lord will grant to you everything he said he would give to you so that you can stay on that path of truth. Otherwise, you're going to be in that, well, the place many have been for too long, this place of indecision, this place of doubt. Is this God or is this not God? You know, that type thing. The Lord wants you sure and experienced with his deliverance. But he'll never go against your own personal will. So it's time to it's time to really analyze yourself regarding your own will and actually starting to find out what the Father's will is for your life and choose so that you can get on with it. For all those who love the Lord, he does love you too, big time. He's got a lot of things prepped for you, but you cannot have them on your own path. What the Lord has for you is only on the path of righteousness. It is not on any other path. Remember that. Well, you know what I think? Here's what I think. My personal thoughts on this. I know that the Lord is going to finish the work he began in all of you. But it is escalating. It's escalating. The work is escalating. Things are escalating. And he's going to help us. See, many people won't make a decision until extraordinary things begin to happen. Now, he's not giving you proof. He said he's not doing that. He's not giving proof. But prophecy will begin to come forward. Real prophecy. In fact, I, I, you know, I don't want to share this too much, but... I had a dream, a very strange dream, and it was one of those dreams. I'm telling you now, it was one of those dreams that people were watching television, and they were introducing, they were showing a, a five or six people, but there was something else with those five or six people, and they were introducing this to the world. Listen to me. Something new was being introduced to the world, and it was, it was among four or five people, and it was very scary to watch. But it was being shown to the world for the first time. And it caused everybody to hush. I mean everybody. Because anybody who saw it, they all reported the same thing. That they felt something from it. And they knew it was real. But in that moment, there were many who believed, who really began to repent. They did. Obviously, whatever they saw struck a chord with them deep within. And they began to repent. That's what I call a wake-up call. But there was something there that put a bad taste in your mouth. To see it would change the taste in your mouth. It was also quite fearful. It was among people. They went further to attempt to uh, show people more. They did. I didn't get to see the rest of it. But I'm telling you right now, that event woke some people up. It did. It woke some people up. Because they found out that this earth was a little more than what they thought it was. Their dependency upon the Lord and priest, who was doing the showing, it was on every single news channel. It was on all computers, and everybody was reviewing it. They kept doing it over and over again. It was some sort of a thing among people, is what they were showing. No, it was no one making a speech. This was a thing among people, and those things were all over the place. And they were finally introduced to the world. What is this why you call this a council of time? A council is more than one person. A council is, in fact, a, a body of advisement, a group of people who advise. Of time means at a specific time, right? So that means collectively, not, not one individual running the whole show, dictating everything, no. By way of a lot of people that the Lord calls, things happen. 
elements of time are understood that way too. The timing that we're in, for example, can't be understood by one person, but it must be understood by a group of people. So the main emphasis is on not one person running the entire show, but that it will be run by a council, a whole lot more than one person. Well, now you know. Somebody says, can we cover children? Don't put children in your care. You are their covering, so then cover them. You absolutely can. Think back to your own life and other people who've been abused before their before the age where they can absolutely make decisions for themselves. Things happen to them. They have no cover. Many of you who were abused, you can be a covering for somebody else. When you prayed and when you wanted someone to see the real situation, they would not, would they? They were so self-absorbed, they only knew about their own personal truth. That's what happened. Okay, let's see, how does it, I know you are marked with God because their mind tricks don't work on that. So AI doesn't have to read your mind. It reads every twitch and micro-movement in the human body. It also knows what you're prone to do because it has your history. So that's very easy. The problem is with what the Lord has set up in the end days. It goes beyond emotion. It goes beyond your intentions. It does. It goes beyond quite a few things. But most importantly about the end days is that the Lord will have direct intervention for your lives. He won't fail we see space from down here on the ground and we think we're experts on what's in space we are not just like people speak of angels and they have no idea what they're addressing just like they speak of the planets having no idea what they really are they're assuming because they can't see it they're assuming these places are devoid of life they're not devoid of life and people will find that but people speak like they're experts in these subjects like the moon, they say there is no moon or nobody went to the moon, this and the other. Or the earth, they say the earth is not, you know, round, it's this way or that way. And the truth is they don't really know. So when it says that's the fruit of the spirit take time to develop, the fruit of the spirit comes. When you walk in the spirit, that's the fruit you leave. That's what happens. That's what you wake is all about. That's what you leave in your trail. No longer do you leave a trail of carnage, but of spiritual fruit. That's what happens with spiritual fruit. Somebody said this World War III coming soon. In my opinion, World War III has already begun. Wars don't start out with the first big boom. They normally start out in, 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 uh, in smaller ways. In this case, hacking. There's been a lot of hacking. The power grid has been affected in a couple of places. Even last night, some power stations were assaulted last night. Do you guys know this? There are going to be lots of things happening. There will be. Don't get excited about it. Just keep your faith. Somebody says, question, how far on the East Coast will the water come? I don't want to say how far, but I, I, I will say that all coasts are going to be affected. I will say that. Listen, they're trying very hard to, to present normalcy. The Army Corps of Engineers, is uh, they put some more pumps in. For example, in, in uh, Canada. Canada is being utilized to stop some of the saltwater intrusion from taking place, but it's not going to hold every time they, you know, block one passage, two more give way. So, there we are. Somebody says, how soon will the coast be affected? That can be at any time. I can literally be at any time. You have to, here, here's one thing, guys. When you look for, look for dates and times, is almost irrelevant, and I'll tell you why. How many of you are ready to leave the, to, to, uh, to evacuate your homes because of a nuclear explosion right now. How many? Hardly anybody, huh? Well, I'd say this. First of all, you're not going to be driving your cars. You're still ready to go if a nuclear weapon hits. Second of all, your power is going to go out. Are you, are you still ready for this? So you're going to have a loss of power and no vehicle before the nuclear weapon actually hits. So how many are ready for that? Here's my point. We can get prepared for such things but until it starts to happen you're not really aware if you're ready or not but for those who trust in the lord who are diligent not commanding not boisterous but diligent those are the ones who have the better idea from the holy spirit as to what they need to do and when they need to do it but either way the lord will bring you through he already promised to deliver his children from whatever they get themselves into during this time right and he just trust his method of deliverance. Trust his method. Somebody says can't afford to prepare. Even if you can't afford to prepare, the Lord has made a way for you. Trust his plan for your life. Now in my own personal life, I'll never seek to save my own skin. 
I'm not doing that, which means whatever the Lord decides, I'm prepped for, ready. Until that time hits, though, I will with full confidence go forward with the gospel, with what he's given me to do. So I'm really not concerned about anything that may boast it has the power to stop what uh, the Lord has given me to do. And the reason why is because I have confidence in the most time. It's already written, he will finish the work he began in you. All of you have some sort of work that he initialized in. He's going to finish that. Let him do it his way. Take no thought of what he deems as good for your life. Somebody says, do you believe another pandemic is coming this winter? Yes. Yes, I do. Somebody said to be absent from the body is be present with the Lord. So who is the dead in Christ? That rise first. There's a place, right? Take note. If you go back in the Bible and you read, the dead in Christ and those who are in the graves are not always the same. Da -da. Those who died in Christ, there's a place. Jesus said to that thief, he said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. That's what he said. But what did Jesus tell us? He said, I go to pre prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. We also know that Hades... The lake of fire and hell are two different things, correct? If you really look into the Word of God, you'll see a place where those who have fought the good fight of faith, how they have established something and what happens to them. But then at the end, at the end, at the end of all things, they are rewarded. Something that will blow your mind is happening. Having said that, it looks like, and it indeed is interpreted as something uh, uh, similar in people's minds. They really think people are going to test People are going to come out the graves, this and the other, a second time or something, right? Or that that's where everybody goes in the first place, into the grave. That's what they believe, right? But but I challenge everybody to look at the words being used. And it gives you a clear vision. Let me tell you one of the biggest problems, one of the bigger problems is this. It, it's no secret that Catholics have a different set of explanations than the Greeks did. And for the most part, a lot of people are following Catholic, uh, 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 Catholic dictates when they believe certain things, and certainly all over the internet. So what you have to do is you have to read the word of God yourself. Do your due diligence. Just take out that word, right? Take out that word, the grave, the dead in Christ. Take those out. Go back to the original Greek and begin to look into it. It's quite simple. But sometimes the interpretation makes it complicated or makes it sound complicated. But he's talking about something very simple. Unfortunately, it's something you have to see. If I were to speak it right now, you'd dispute it. That's why I'm telling you to do it yourselves. So that you can see it yourselves. And let that be a pearl. Let that be confidence with you. But there are no human spirits on the earth. No human spirits roam the earth. None. A lot went to rest a long time ago. 